What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And as always, we have ourselves a jam-packed show as we have a lot to get into in the world of volleyball, such as McKendry, who predicted them to pulling off the upset in the MIBA. They did take down Loyola of Chicago. Thankfully, I didn't make my predictions in terms of who's going to win each conference tournament, because that's going to be for today's episode. And how about Long Beach State pulling out the gritty reverse sweep over UC Irvine? Can they have a little bit of a repeat performance this week, or will Hawaii put the brakes on them? Also, UCLA, can anyone stop UCLA in men's volleyball and in beach volleyball as the Lady Bruins won the center of effort challenge against the likes of TCU and USC. Yes, TCU is no longer undefeated. And I've got some NBA and ABP to recap. So hand me a volleyball, set up the net, because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taron Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. Thank you all for joining me on this beautiful Monday afternoon, Monday morning, Monday early afternoon, early Monday evening. Either way, you have made your way into episode 190 of Set Point. Soon we're going to be celebrating episode 200, just 10 more episodes to go, but that's not what I, why I'm here. The point is, let us get into that volleyball goodness. But first and foremost, Set Point would not be where it's at without IE Sports Radio providing the platform to go live on Spreaker. Please do follow them on Twitter, TikTok, and on Instagram at IE Sports Radio. We also have a Facebook page for those that still use Facebook. All you just got to do is type in the word IE, then sports, then radio, and then just like us and follow us on Facebook, and then that's how you're able to follow us on Facebook. We also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com, and once you go there, you'll see a Patreon link at the top of the website, and once you click it, donations will start out at $5 a month if you choose to donate. This will get you a shout-out from all 26 of our shows, and higher tiers include iSportsRadio merchandise, access to IESRU, our podcasting university, and even a chance to be featured on a segment of our flagship show, The Defining Moment, with Larry B. Because for the past eight years going on nine years which will be in about a month or so, probably less than a month, iSports Radio has been bringing you amazing content ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel, such as Matt Prosser from last week, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. All the while, we've been continuing to be by the fans and for the fans, and with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you to everyone for all of your support and for making iSports Radio your direct feed for all that sports, shout out to our Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Key to the Gate, Marcus Lowe's Great, and a donor that wishes to remain anonymous. And with all that said and done, let's get on into it. So we have to recap some NCAA men's volleyball, as it was a quiet week in terms of upsets, but there were some darn good matches, as we have to start off with the big upset of the weekend. Well, we actually had two upsets. We actually had, in terms of, like, the conference... The, we, we had the Northeast Conference. We had Farley Dickinson upsetting Damon. Now, Damon was fighting for first place, and the day after, this was on Friday, Damon actually had a big-time matchup against St. Francis of Pennsylvania, a.k.a. St. Francis U. Not St. Francis Brooklyn, but St. Francis U. So, unfortunately for Damon, they kind of looked ahead, and they lost to Farley Dickinson in four sets which was huge for Farley Dickinson because they were fighting for their NEC tournament lives or Northeast Conference tournament lives. They actually went 2-0, and but unfortunately they finished tied with Merrimack for 6th place. But for Merrimack, they were the ones that got the final bid into the NEC tournament. So it was a tough end for 
Farley Dickinson or FDU. But honestly, they showed some jersey grit this past weekend. So good on Carl Francis' team. But back to Damon, they actually did fall in four sets, and they also wound up losing to St. Francis U, or St. Francis of Pennsylvania, in four sets on Saturday, which eventually cost them the number one seed in the NEC tournament, and it also cost them the regular season NEC championship, which it is what it is, but... I don't know how they lost to Farley Dickinson or Fairley Dickinson. Either way, it's kind of concerning, but it's like I hope they got their la- their losses out of the way or their bad loss out of the way. I'm not going to really go into detail on that loss just because um, – or any of those matches just because when it came to those matches, like what truly matters for Damon is the NEC tournament. Like they already got their top two seed locked up, and they should they will have a bye up up until the semifinals, which will be this week. And then for St. Francis U, it's a big win for them. Remember, they were in the EIVA last year, and then they transitioned this year into the NEC, and now they're already making a big splash in the conference. So good on the Red Flash. I almost. Couldn't, I was almost blanked on their mascot name, but they're known as the Red Flash. So that's that for the NEC. Now we got to get into the big upset in terms of McKendry and Loyola. This was on Saturday, and oh my goodness, this was a big win for McKendry. Now McKendry, if we all remember, McKendry lost to Quincy, which was the, I think it was on the second to last week of the MIVA season regular season and they wound up losing to a Quincy team that had lost 26 consecutive conference games and they lost in five sets. McKendry was the 7 seed going into the MIVA tournament and Loyola Chicago was the 2 seed. So for Loyola, they took the first set 25-19 and it looks like everything is going hunky dory. They didn't trail in that set. Everything's going Great guns for Loyola Chicago. Then in the second set, McKendry eked out that second set eight or twenty-five to twenty-three. There were eight ties and three lead changes. The third set, McKendry jumped out to an early lead. They never trailed. There were no ties, and they wound up winning that third set twenty-five twenty. At the time, I did I forgot this match was going on just because I was kind of focusing on Long Beach State UC Irvine just because that match had an earlier start time. But I was very surprised on how Loyola was just not themselves. They already didn't look like themselves last week against Ball State and Ohio State. But it's like I, I said last week that I'm hoping that this was, those two losses were the last bad losses we would see out of Loyola. And in the fourth set, Loyola wound up taking that 25-20. It was tied ten times, and there were three lead changes, but Loyola was able to take that fourth set, forcing the Cinco sets. But in that fifth set, that was basically when McKendry pulled the plug on the Rambler season as they won that fifth set 15-12, to advancing to the MIVA semifinals. McKendry, I didn't really tweet this out but at the time of this recording, but McKendry gets my NCAA Men's Volleyball Team of the Week honor. And that's a huge win for McKendry considering they haven't had too many big wins this season. So that's huge for the Wildcats as they were led by Bryce Wetgen, who had 22 kills. Kyle Wilson had 21 kills. And Roland Lively had 7 kills. As a team, McKendry hit 333. And they only had 2 blocks, but they did outdig Loyola 41-37. to And despite missing 17 service aces and only having four service, or 17 serves, despite missing 17 serves and only having four service aces, McKendry was fairly efficient for the most part. They did get blocked nine times, but honestly, they really held their own against Loyola, especially since they held them to only six kills in that final set. And honestly, considering Loyola hit such a high hitting percentage, they hit 415 in the match. That's quite incredible that McKendry was able to pull out that win. And, again, sometimes you just need to have... It's so tough to beat a team three times. Like, the first match between Loyola and McKendry, it had to go five. Then the second time, it had to go four. 
Now, this time around, McKendry was able to pull off the upset, which was huge. And let me just tell you, Loyola has not been touched when it comes to playing in Gentile Arena. That's kind of been their safe haven, as I want to say that that was their first loss in uh, in uh, in Gentile Arena this season, just because they haven't really had too many losses in Gentile. If not, that that it was yeah, it's their, it was their first loss in Gentile Arena this season. They had went fourteen and zero in the regular season, and then when they faced McKendry, they wound up losing in Gentile Arena, aka Lila at Chicago. So. Man, that's such a big upset for McKendry as that was the only upset in the first round of the MIVA tournament. Lewis took down Purdue Fort Wayne, which I kind of was a little surprised, but it's like not really just because Purdue Fort Wayne is kind of in that off and on switch. Um, Ohio State swept Lindenwood and then Ball State took down Quincy. So your semifinals consist of Ball State and Lewis and... Ohio State and what's their face? Ohio State and McKendry. <laughs> I was blanking on their name. Loyola was led by Parker Van Buren, who had 21 kills. Cole Schlotthauer had seven or 16 kills. Jamie Meinhart had seven kills. Nicodemus Meyer had six kills. But like I said, Loyola hit 415. They even hit 600 in the two sets that they won. And they even hit 400 in set two. It's just that the third set, they kind of just did not look like themselves. And then the fifth set, I just feel they ran out of gas. So for Loyola, this is kind of a disappointment. I mean, yes, they've had some other bad losses, like the loss against Princeton, the loss against Concordia Irvine, but this one kind of takes the cake. I mean, Loyola just had such a great year. And, you know, with Parker Van Buren... I want to say on the on the horizon of graduating, I want to say he's... And then Cole Schlotthauer is their senior as well. Actually, Parker Van Buren's the only redshirt sophomore. I'm thinking of Schlotthauer, who's on the verge of graduating. But still, it's like for Schlotthauer to go out like that, that's kind of saddening, if you ask me. And I know they have such a young team. And then also Nick Martinsky is also graduating as well. He's a graduate player, but... I know they that's only two seniors on their team, but it's like you had to go out like that. You didn't even advance to the semifinals. Like that's kind of saddening. I know McKendry did the same thing last year to Loyola, but it's like gosh. That's that's surprising, if you ask me. Or was it Purdue Fort Wayne? Either way, Loyola just really disappointed me in this match. I just thought they would be so much better, considering they've had such a solid year. And it was Purdue Fort Wayne that Loyola lost to last year, not McKendry. So my apologies on that. So Loyola, eh, this was also a bid stealer for McKendry, just because I felt if Loyola got to the finals, even if they didn't win this tournament, I think they would have gotten in as an at-large. But now, since they lost, there's no way the committee takes Loyola into the NCAA tournament. They do not take a team that was the two seed of their tournament that clinched a share of the MIVA conference title, and they're not going to take them into the NCAA tournament. There are much better teams that deserve the NCAA tournament than Loyola, so as an at-large, of course. So, unfortunately for Loyola, it looks like the season is pretty much over. So, tough luck for the Ramblers, and tough luck for the city of Chicago, but the good news is for the city of Chicago and volleyball, you still have the Chicago Untouchables. Anyway, so that's that for the MIVA. Also on Saturday, we had Long Beach State UC Irvine round two. Now round one was kind of a dud. I didn't really make that match until like the pretty much the closing of set number three, where UC Irvine was trying to make one last push, but they wound up unfortunately not being able to. And I was told I didn't really miss much just because Long Beach State thrashed the U knows. The you know what out of them. They they thrashed the stuffing out of UC Irvine. The second match was kind of a little bit better for the Ant Ears. So the first set, Long Beach State was actually up twenty one twenty. It was kind of that back and forth set. Like I was surprised that David Niffin called timeout before the media timeout because it was fourteen fourteen at the time, and then he just calls timeout after Long Beach reels off three in a row, and it's like you have the media timeout. You know that, right? 
But I guess he just really needed to talk to his team that badly. So, anyway. And then, eventually, UC Irvine closed out the set on a 5-1 run and took that first set 25-22. That momentum eventually carried over into set number two as UC Irvine won that set 25-18. And then I'm getting really surprised at this. Now, Brent Event Center is kind of a tough place to win at, and UC Irvine is a very good team with all of their very talented players like Francesco Sani, Hilir Hanno, Connor Campbell had himself a nice game, Cole Gillis has all has been a solid weapon for the Anteaters this season, though he didn't really get to play in set four and five. But Long Beach State just did not look like themselves in that second set. They were playing very awry, even though Irvine was not hitting the best. They only hit 235, as was Long Beach State. Believe it or not, they actually had the same numbers in set number two, outside of, like, the side-out percentage, of course, but I digress. It's just the hitting percentage and the attempts and the kills and the errors and whatnot. So there's that. But at the time, UC Irvine was up 2 nothing. Hawaii fans were probably just salivating at this because they knew if Long Beach State lost to UC Irvine, all Hawaii needed to do was win, and they'd be outright Big West Conference champions. The third set came. Long Beach State was down 13-11. to And I'm thinking, is this just going to be like the women's match where UC Irvine swept Long Beach State on their senior night? Well, Allen Knight called timeout at 13-11, and, well, Long Beach State, whatever Allen Knight said... Long Beach State adjusted, and they really turned the tide on the Anteaters as they eventually won that third set 25-20. to It just looked a whole lot better as Long Beach State hit 667 in that third set. They only had one hitting error, and they had 15 kills. And even when UC Irvine hit 379, they just... Long Beach State looked so much better. Then the fourth set, it was a little bit back and forth, but Long Beach State pulled that fourth set off winning it 25-20. Long Beach only had two hitting errors in that set. They hit 480 while holding Irvine to only 143. Now the fifth set, Ir- yeah, Long Beach State went up 6-2, to two, and it looked like UC Irvine had no control over the match. But UC Irvine was working its way back one point at a time. The problem was they just could not get a good side out. They just weren't covering properly against Long Beach. They just could not dig a ball really well. They couldn't block. In the match, Irvine only had eight and a half blocks. Like, it seemed like Irvine was just not themselves after that second set. And that's no disrespect to them. I think Irvine played good. UC Irvine played good. But Long Beach State just had so much more veteran experience, and they knew what was on the line, and they were in this situation last week, or the previous week, when they were down 0-2 to CSUN, and they wound up reverse-sweeping the Matadors. So, this time around, Long Beach State was, eventually was up 12-11, as Irvine got within one, but that was the problem. They couldn't get anywhere closer, as Long Beach just kept distancing themselves they're up 14-11. Irvine got within one after two straight kills, but then they just left Sotira Shapanis wide open for the Bick. And I'm surprised that David Niffin was using his challenges left and right. I understand he was trying to get multiple timeouts, but it's like, you kind of want to save your challenges for a little bit later. As Larry B., says he's up in here. Thanks for tuning in, Larry. Uh, I'm sorry if I uh, missed you in the chat room, but uh, I did see you in the chat room. Don't worry. I did I did see you in the chat room. I, I'm not ignoring you or anything, but... Anyway, back to UC Irvine. The problem was for UC Irvine against Long Beach State in round two was that in set five, they just could not find a way to basically get close closer or tie up the set against Long Beach State. So... Yeah. And so Tira Shaponis closed out the match with a bit kill. And every UC Irvine match was just so heartbroken. Every UC Irvine fan was just so heartbroken. Part of me kind of wanted to see the chaos just because I wanted to see how Hawaii Twitter would react to UC Irvine beating Long Beach State. But with Long Beach State winning, Long Beach eventually clinched a share of the Big West Conference championship in terms of the regular season. 
Now, it was, at the time, they did not know what the result of Hawaii-UC San Diego was because, at the time, the two hadn't played one another. Because the two were playing at 10 p.m. Pacific time, which was 7 p.m. Hawaii time. So, they didn't know if they were going to be outright champions, but at the very least, they were co-conference champions. So, after the match, despite having to try to track down Long Beach State following their their win and their celebration of winning the Big West Conference Championship. I eventually found Alan Knipe and I caught up with him following his team's win over UC Irvine and what it meant clinching a share of the Big West Conference regular season championship. All right, this is Taryn Rodriguez of Set Point with Long Beach State men's volleyball coach Alan Knight following his team's reverse sweep win en route to clinching at least a share of the Big West Conference title. All right, coach, your team was down 0-2, but you managed to turn the tide on the road against UC Irvine. What were the keys to taking down a very tough anteater team? Yeah, I think it, you know the, the match was totally different than last night, and we knew that. I don't think we handled it real well. Uh, early in the first set, I think we played well in the, in the back end of the first set, but we, we kind of gave away too many easy points early on, and uh, you know that that cost us the first one. And then it was just they have momentum and they're feeling it. They're at home and they're pressing. They're playing well, and we weren't comfortable for a while. But I was really proud of the guys in the third and fourth and fifth set. We dialed in. We got our offense going. Hit a, hit a really big number, continue to pass the ball well, and then our block and defense kind of and transition kind of took over. The third set, they were up 13-11. You called timeout. Do you remember what you said in that timeout to propel your team? Yeah, it's just, you know, young guys, even though they're college guys, young guys, anxiety gets the best of everybody, you know, and you just need to settle it down and, and focus on prepping for the next point, whether it's block and defense, your serve, clearing your mind, and, and trust in the process and trust in our systems and trust in their talent. And once they started to settle down a little bit, they were, they were pretty darn good. Simon didn't have the biggest numbers offensively, but defensively, he came up big. He was a blocking machine. He had eight kills. What can you say about Simon in his big night? Well, obviously, that's what he's been doing all year, so that doesn't surprise me. He also served really well, and he was a big part of the composure of the guys. So, yeah, he had a great night. Your team clinched a share of the Big West Conference Championship. Obviously, you had the bye, but how big is this moment for your team going into the Big West Conference Championship? Big West Conference Tournament next week. Yeah, they're all big. They're all big. You want to keep playing well, and you want to find new ways to squeeze out wins in, in, in matches. And obviously, we weren't wasn't by design to be down 0-2 and, and win in five. But you know what you get out of it is the grit that came from it. You're super proud of, and you file that one away. That you know that uh, this isn't the first time this year actually been for us being down 0-2 to come back and win in five. So it's not that it's something you're proud of, but it does happen. you got to give credit to really good teams, and Irvine's a very good team with a lot of good arms. And, but there's always a way if you want to if you want to just win the next point. I thought our guys grinded through that pretty nicely tonight. Coach, thank you for your time. Congratulations on the win, and good luck next week. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. So Tira Shipanis led the way for Long Beach State with 16 kills, while Clark Godbold added 15 kills. Spencer Olivier added 12 kills. Um, I made a mistake when I said Simon Torre had eight kills. He had eight blocks. He had two kills, but he didn't have an error. So, my mistake on that, everybody. Um, Shane Holdaway also chipped in seven kills. Mason Briggs had 12 digs. Shapanis had 11 digs. Eight and nine, nine digs to go along with his 46 assists. Long Beach didn't really serve the ball ultimately great. They only had two service aces and 21 missed serves, but... Like Alan Knipe said, they found a way. And sometimes when you when you don't even need to play your best, you just got to find a way to win. And when you're on the road in a hostile environment against a UC Irvine team that has nothing to play for except for, like, maybe, I don't know, boosting their at-large resume, that's kind of big right there. So for Long Beach, I give them a lot of credit for doing that on the road and – for the second time, but you just can't do that multiple times. You just can't do that twice in a row. I mean, you can obviously get away with that against CSUN and maybe UC Irvine, but you can't do that against the teams like UCLA or Hawaii or Penn State. Like, it just doesn't work that way. So I give lots of credit to Alan Knipe and his team. 
unfortunately for him, well, I shouldn't say that unfortunately that much, but um, Hawaii did manage to sweep UC San Diego, which is no surprise. I mean, was Hawaii going to lose to UC San Diego on their senior night? No. So, anyway, Hawaii clinched the other share of the Big West Conference Championship. More importantly, Hawaii clinched the number one seed in the Big West Conference Tournament, and that's huge right there just because they get to avoid UC Irvine, and that's a team that no one wants to face. Long Beach State could, hence the word could, face UC Irvine in the Big West Conference Tournament yet again, but UC Irvine has to get past the likes of Cal State Northridge, or CSUN, who has been on the biggest slippery slope. And funny I should mention that, um, I caught, I actually met with David Niffin, before the, David Niffin, the UC Irvine men's volleyball coach, before the game. And he's like, who's going to be finishing sixth in the Big West Conference? And, um, and I, I, out of the blue, I said CSUN. And then I joke, I kind of jokingly said, I changed my mind. Maybe it's, it's going to be UC San Diego. But then I foolishly thought, I don't know what's going on with CSUN, but regardless, that's not the point. The point is, UC Irvine will be playing on Thursday in the quarterfinals against Cal State Northridge. I actually caught up with UC Irvine men's volleyball coach David Niffin after his team's loss to Long Beach State and what it's going to take to possibly get back on track and win their first game of the Big West Conference Tournament and possibly get a rematch with the beach. All right, Coach. Obviously, it was a tough loss. He gave Long Beach State a battle, but he came up just a little bit short. What were some positives you could take away from this match going into next week's Big West Conference Tournament? We're always looking to improve as a team, and there's no question we were better tonight than last night. And even in that final fifth set, you know, being down two to six, climbing back up and, you know, obviously losing 13-15, but... Uh, I don't feel like we lost composure in that set, and we just committed to playing the best volleyball we could. Obviously, the two-headed monster, Francesco and Halir, had big games, but Connor had some good swings. He had 10 kills. What can you say about Connor and also Cole, who had himself a solid game? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, we really need everybody playing well enough just by nature of what those guys can do, Halir and Francesco. They're going to receive more opportunities. Um, and especially against a tough-serving team, you're going to see the, the opposite receive more opportunities. Uh, but, yeah, everybody played their part. You were up 13-11 in that third set. What do you think kind of got away from you in that third set, or do you think that was just Long Beach adjusting? No, I mean, it, if you look at the third set, I mean, just even looking at the numbers, were it, we gave too many points away, and they didn't. You know, they played a real clean offensive third set. They played a cleaner serving third set than we did. Um, we didn't give ourselves enough opportunities. And then going into next week's Big West Conference Tournament, obviously you're hosting, and then you'll have to play on Thursday against either UC San Diego, CSUN, or UC Santa Barbara as of this recording. What's it going to take to get through that first matchup and not look ahead to a possible semifinal against Long Beach State? Yeah, that, that shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, the nice thing about the Big West is everybody is such a formidable opponent. You know, even though we have to rank ourselves one through six, everybody's pretty good. So I don't anticipate that being an issue. Were there any other standouts or unsung heroes tonight? Uh, you know, Cole Power, I thought, made some great plays on some really tough situations. Akil stepped in for Cole Gillis uh, and nailed some really tough serves. Uh, the overall kind of block defensive play was a bit of an unsung hero. You saw some really nice rallies tonight. Mm -hmm. So that's not a specific person, but just a lot of guys working hard. UC Irvine was led by Francesco Sani, who had 20 kills, while Halir Heno added 16 kills. Like I mentioned in the recording, Connor Campbell had 10 kills. Cole Gillis, who did not play in sets 4 and 5, had 6 kills. As a team, UC Irvine hit 241. I feel they kind of were go crashing. I wouldn't say crashing, but they were drifting back down to earth after the first three sets, following that that the end of set number three. Like they hit three seventy nine in set number three, but then they just did not look like themselves in sets four and five. And it sucks because 
I think Irvine is a good team. The problem was that they just ran into an adjusted Long Beach team in set number three. So you have to play clean volleyball against a team like Long Beach State. Otherwise, you're going to get eaten alive. And <clears throat> unfortunately for the Ant Eaters, they kind of let that one slip away. The good news is for the Ant Eaters is that it's better that they lost now than they than in the Big West Conference tournament because now it's it gets real and I am confident UC Irvine will bounce back from this. They just got to get up off the mat and they got to learn to they got to close out. I, I'm sure they will though. Like against CSUN, what I think CSUN has lost ten in a row if I'm not mistaken. But CSUN has been on the biggest slippery slope ever since that 10-game winning streak. And, yeah, they've lost 10 in a row. Ever since winning 10 in a row, they've now lost 10 in a row following that one loss to UC San Diego. So it's been tough times for the Matadors as they now have to play at UC Irvine against the tournament host as they've also – I'm not going to spoil it. They fell out of the top 15 – and they lost to UC Santa Barbara twice, so CSUN's going to really have to get their you-know-what together because they're going to face a Irvine team who is very mad. So for UC Irvine, I think they are still a good team, and I really think they're going to really turn some heads in the Big West Conference tournament, especially since they're hosting. Like You don't want to like let down your fans that are seeing you in person now, do you? Of course not. So we'll see what happens come this week. I will be there for all three days, and it's sure to be a humdinger, a barn burner, a dandy, you name it. So other results that happened last weekend, we had BYU defeating Stanford twice, which BYU finished the regular season undefeated. Well, they finished the season altogether undefeated just because they're not going to be able to play. Oh, und- not undefeated. I'm sorry. They finished the regular season undefeated at home. I'm sorry. BYU finished the regular season undefeated at home. They did not lose a match at Smithfield House, which is incredible if you ask me. So good job to the Cougars. Now they have to go to NorCal to, to play in the MPSF tournament. They are the two seed. Stanford finished as the three seed, even though they tied with Grand Canyon. But you got to remember... Stanford has that tiebreaker, that head-to-head tiebreaker over the Lopes. Grant Cannon finished their season, so they finished fourth. Pepperdine lost to UCLA twice, so they finished fifth, which was kind of expected. USC beat Concordia twice, so they get lumped over Concordia in terms of the MPSF standings. So they finished sixth and seventh in terms of USC and Concordia. So there's that right there, and obviously we know that UCLA won the MPSF regular season championship, and they're the number one seed in the MPSF tournament. In the EIVA, we had Penn State defeating Charleston, which, well, defeating Charleston twice, which was no real surprise right there, and honestly, Penn State is playing some darn good volleyball right there, right here and now, and I'm not surprised that they're not they're they haven't been really skipping a beat. They only dropped one set all conference. Now I know they only had what eight conference games? Ten conference games. My I'm sorry, I can't do math correctly. They only had ten conference games, but it's like that's still kind of incredible to not lose a set in conference play. So good on Penn State for staying pretty much flawless as they are the number one seed in the EIVA tournament and they get home court advantage. Princeton is the number two seed, and they will also receive a first round bye as well as Penn State. Charleston finished third in the EIVA as they will take on NJIT, who I feel bad for NJIT, unfortunately, just because they've had such a they had such decent expectations. They were I think they were slated to either finish second or third in the preseason, but now they just fell apart just because of injuries and whatnot. But hey, the best ability is availability. And then fourth and fifth was Harvard and George Mason. So that's basically rounding that basically rounds up the EIVA conference. So 
that is pretty much that for the NCAA men's volleyball side of things. I didn't mention Charleston Penn State as a matchup to watch for last week just because Penn State had already locked up the EIVA tournament and or not the EIVA tournament, the EIVA number 1 seed and the regular season conference championship. So it didn't really mean a whole lot to preview Charleston at Penn State. So nothing against that matchup, though. I mean, Charleston, I'll give them a lot of credit. They have done really well in terms of improvement this season. But they're kind of facing the big dogs in Princeton and Penn State. And they also had that one loss to George Mason. So, ouch-a-rama. But we'll see what happens if the real Charleston comes to play. But they're kind of on the path of Princeton, who is playing some darn good volleyball. Princeton is playing really good volleyball as of late. And that's kind of when Pe- Princeton's at their best. I mean, you saw what they did last year against Penn State and the rest of the EIVA tournament. They wound up winning that whole thing, even as, what, a four, four, four seed and... You gotta give credit to Sam Schweisky. He does an excellent job with that program, and early on, it didn't look like uh, it seemed like Princeton was going to be off to a sluggish start. But now Princeton is just clicking on all cylinders, and that's kind of when Princeton is at their best. They're playing; they play well in the late stages of the season. All right, that's that for the NCAA men's volleyball season. Or the NCAA, yeah, the NCAA men's volleyball week for week number fifteen. Let's jump on in to the AVCA men's volleyball coaches poll, just because I got to preview some NCAA men's volleyball conference tournaments, which I know you all y'all are probably on pins and needles about that. So the AVCA men's volleyball coaches poll didn't really change a lot. So there were some changes at the bottom, but. Most of it was just the same. So 15 through 11 consists of Princeton at 15, Charleston at 14, Loyola Chicago at 13, USC at 12, and Ohio State at 11. 10 through 6 consists of Ball State at 10, Pepperdine at 9, Stanford at 8, Grand Canyon at 7, and BYU at 6. 5 through 1 consists of UC Irvine at 5, Long Beach State at 4, Penn State at 3, UCLA at two, and your still number one team in the AVC8 men's national collegiate coaches poll is Hawaii. So, yeah, there was nothing really surprising about that, about the top 11. Loyola losing was kind of expected for them to drop as USC kind of surpassed them. Charleston being ranked over Princeton kind of boggles my mind just because it's like... Really? You have Princeton over Charleston, or Princeton behind Charleston, even though Princeton beat Charleston twice last week, and Charleston lost to Penn State. I know Charleston has the wins, but it's like Princeton, in my opinion, kind of has the schedule, and Princeton's playing some darn good volleyball, and they also beat Loyola Chicago, which is something Charleston could not do, so... I kind of frown upon Princeton being behind Charleston in the AVCA men's volleyball coaches pool, but it's like, it is what it is. All right, that is that for the AVCA men's volleyball coaches pool. So now we got to get on into the conference tournament. So this is the last week of before the NCAA tournament in terms of men's volleyball as this week is conference tournament, uh, week and oh my goodness this is where it gets real so now i'm gonna give you all my predictions of who i think is gonna make the finals of each conference tournament and who is going to win each conference tournament so we'll start off with the conference of carolinas and i'm gonna be honest i haven't been really paying too much attention to this all I can really tell you <laughs> is that North Greenville has just been the alpha male of this conference. King has been improving, and Belmont Abbey's right behind them. Erskine has also been pretty solid as well. But my finalists, or the two teams that I think are going to make the finals of the Conference of Carolinas tournament are North Greenville and... Hmm... I want to go with Erskine... But at the same time, King looks pretty solid as well. 
Belmont Abbey looks also impressive as well. I mean, Belmont Abbey's on the same side as North Greenville, so I don't think I can really give them the shot. I'll I'll say King. I'll say King gets in. I think King and North Greenville will be the finals of the Conference Carolinas tournament. And then North Greenville wins the Conference of Carolinas tournament. So that's kind of your brief brief little spiel of the Conference of Carolinas tournament. And it's kind of tough to really pick against Conference of Carol pick against uh, North Greenville. And I think I'd like to see another rematch between King and uh, North Greenville, just because that would be the rubber match, just because King actually beat North Greenville on February February 8th. So I think round three is kind of in the books. But for King to get there, they have to get past Erskine, which they also split against. So we'll see what happens come, come that uh, tournament. Or come that round. But we'll see. Alright, so that's that for the Conference of Carolinas. Jumping over to the NEC, or the Northeast Conference. Okay. So, my finalists for that conference will be St. Francis U and Damon. I think Damon has been fairly consistent for the most part this season. Not just against its conference, but well, outside of last week, but uh, not just against its conference, outside of St. Francis, but throughout most of the season. They got that first ever ranked win against CSUN, and they've been so great. Uh, now, obviously, the two losses were very frowned upon just because they could have possibly won the regular season conference championship, but unfortunately, they got tripped up against FDU, and they also lost at St. Francis. Now, St. Francis, on the other hand, I think they're playing some pretty darn good volleyball. They've won eight in a row. It's going to be interesting to see who I think can win between Damon and St. Francis. I kind of have to go with St. Francis on this one. I think St. Francis continues their winning ways, but that does not mean Damon is not going to roll over and play dead. I feel Damon have is going to look at themselves and they got to get up off the mat and they got to say, we can't play like what we did last week against Farley Dickinson or Fairley Dickinson. We have to play to our potential. And for Damon, they have the first round by up until the semifinals. So for Damon, they better be using this time to prepare and get better and make sure they correct everything to not have another FDU debacle ever again. Otherwise, that could wind up being the that could wind up costing them their season because Damon has been doing having such a fantastic season, a historic season at that, and for them to basically straight up poop the bed at this stage of the season, following that following last week, is kind of unacceptable. They can't be like a Loyola where they lost twice in the regular season and then they got one and done in the conference tournament, right? I know Loyola had, didn't have the buy just because that's just how the MIVA tournament works, but the same thing can be said for Damon. And fortunately, Damon does not, or fortunately for Damon, the NEC does not have the MIVA tournament format. They don't have every team going into the conference tournament. They just have six teams going into it. So if they did have the MIVA tournament format, then Damon would be, would be playing FDU or Fairleigh Dickinson, and that could be kind of hairy right there just because you never know what could happen between those two teams again. So that's that for the NEC. Jumping over to the MIVA, since that conference is already underway, I kind of feel I kind of feel sick sick for picking this conference when I should have made this prediction last week. But um, my finalists, uh, my original finalists were going to be Loyola and Ball State, and then I was going to have Loyola winning the tournament. But unfortunately, Loyola didn't really make it that far. So as of this point. My finalists are going to be Ohio State and Ball State. And the team that I have winning in the MIVA tournament is Ohio State. I think Ohio State's playing some really good volleyball. And it started with that reverse sweep over Ball State 
which eventually led to that win over Penn State on that one Tuesday, and then it's led to them to this winning streak. And again, Ohio State also came up big the previous week against Loyola, and they also beat Purdue Fort Wayne, which led them to beating Loyola. And they haven't lost a match ever since they lost to Ball State at Ball State. Now, beating Ball State at Ball State could be a troublesome affair just because it's so tough to win in Muncie. But I think Ohio State's playing way better than it did in that first meeting against the Cardinals. But Ball State, I think, is going to be ready. I think for Ball for Ohio State, they've got more weapons offensively. Obviously, Ball State has Caleb Jenis and Tanashi, but it's like, I feel Ohio State's got a whole lot of momentum going on, and I think Ohio State just, I think they're starting to put it together really quick. This is no disrespect to what Do- Donon Cruz has done in terms of the program. Like, I think he's really turned that program around ever since the beginning of conference play. And obviously, last year was a phenomenal run. It's just that this year, Ball State had a different identity. And Ball State really came up big toward the end. Obviously, they got a little bit of help along the way from Loyola's little debacle, courtesy of Purdue Fort Wayne. But honestly... Good teams come up big when it truly matters most. And for Ball State, they were able to come up big when it truly mattered the most. Same with Ohio State. They came up big when it mattered most. So I really think it's going to be Ball State versus Ohio State in the final. But I have Ohio State winning in the final. For Ball State, I would not underestimate Lewis, though. Like, the past two meetings between the Flyers, that... that, Those two teams have seen one another going the distance. So for Ball State, they have to be really careful of Lewis. That team can be really sneaky good, and they seem to have the formula against Ball State. But I really think that Ball State will figure it out against Lewis. As much as I don't want to see McKendree's miracle season or dream season come to an end, I think Ohio State puts it together and takes down McKendree. So I think Ohio State takes down McKendry and eventually takes down Ball State in the MIVA tournament. All right, jumping over to the EIVA tournament. I think this is kind of a no-brainer on who one of the finalists is going to be. Penn State. The other finalist, I got to go with Princeton. I think Princeton is playing its best volleyball as of late, and honestly, nothing against Charleston, but I kind of think Charleston is showing its cracks. Now, obviously, Charleston can get it together come this week, and they'll get a chance to play Princeton, and they could pull out the reverse card against Princeton, as, again, Princeton demonstrated that it's tough to beat a team three times in one season, and Princeton was able to do that against Penn State, where they beat Penn State last year in the EIVA Conference Tournament after losing twice to Penn State. But for Princeton and Penn State, I think they're on a collision course to face one another. I think Princeton's playing its best volleyball. I think Penn State is going to be playing its best volleyball on its home floor. And they know, in the back of their mind, they've got unfinished business to attend to. And they know that in order for them to complete part of their revenge tour. They have to take down the team that beat them in the EIVA semifinals last year, and that was Princeton. So I got to go with Penn State winning the EIVA tournament. I will eat lots of crow if Princeton wins this tournament, but I I have to go with the safe bet, and I have to pick Penn State winning the EIVA tournament. You can't go wrong with with what Mark Pavlik and his team has done. You also can't go wrong with how great Princeton has done and how Sam Schweisky has really turned the tide with that team after a little bit of a rough preseason. But I just think Penn State is going to have their moment to shine in the EIVA tournament. And all they really need is one shining moment and one big match from from the likes of Cal Fisher and all those other players. So we'll see. 
All right, couple more tournaments, and then we'll head to a commercial break. So, got the MPSF. All right. The MPSF has been pretty much ruled by an iron fist by UCLA. And they're one of my finalists to go to the MPSF finals, which, that's no real surprise. My other team, however, I'm actually going to go bold here. And this is probably going to really make a whole lot of y'all surprised and some of y'all mad, but... I'm actually going to pick Stanford to go to the MPSF Finals. Now, you're probably thinking, well, didn't Stanford just lose to BYU twice last week? Yes, they did. However, Stanford will have the luxury of playing in Northern California against BYU. They will no longer have to deal with BYU at Smith Fieldhouse. So, this is my big question for BYU. Can the Cougars beat Stanford in Maples Pavilion because Stanford is the host of this conference tournament. That's going to be a big if. Now, Stanford obviously has to get past USC, which is a scrappy team. And then BYU has to get past Concordia, which Concordia did push them to five the second go around, but I'm fairly certain BYU is going to be ready for the Golden Eagles. So, there's that. But, honestly, I feel that Stanford will be ready for BYU this go-around. I really think Stanford will be ready for BYU this time around. I hate to say that just because I know BYU fans are probably going to really get their just their jimmies jostled. And they're probably listening to this and they're probably really angry at me. But it's like... I think Stanford is going to really... I think they're going to bring it this time around. I will eat my crow next show if Stanford loses to BYU or if Stanford fails to even get out of the first round. But I just think Stanford will get to the final of the MPSF tournament. And I think Stanford could be a possible bid stealer. And that's something I'm going to discuss after I make my prediction for the Big West Conference tournament. But... As for the final between UCLA and Stanford, or my projected final, my conference tournament winner in the MPSF is obviously UCLA. Now, UCLA, nothing's really going to stop them. Nothing has been stopping them in MPSF play through 12 matches, and not a whole lot has been stopping them. So, I just think that UCLA is going to come guns a-blazing. And the only thing that's going to be stopping UCLA is UCLA. Now, Grand Canyon could pose a threat if they get out of the first round, but they take on a Pepperdine team, which split their two matchups with the Lopes, and also, which put a push them the five sets both times. So, we'll see what happens going forward, but I think UCLA is a lock to pretty much win the MPSF. But I'm not, but again, don't count out some of the other teams, and again, I'm not trying to say that Grand Canyon, Stanford, BYU, and all those other teams in the MPSF aren't going to, don't have a chance, but it's like, I think UCLA has just been the alpha male in that conference, and there's no no one that's really stood up to them. They have seen no team has pushed UCLA to five sets, and that's kind of the, the biggest thing for me. Even on the road, UCLA has just looked so composed. So, we'll see what happens with the Bruins this weekend. Now for the Big West Conference. I'm going to be at this this weekend, obviously. But for the Big West Conference, I'm obviously choosing Hawaii to go to the conference tournament finals. And then the other finalist, it's going to be tough between UC Irvine and Long Beach State. Because for the Big West, there's been the, there's only the three-headed monster. Hawaii, Long Beach State, UC Irvine. And as for UC Irvine Long Beach State... I gotta play it safe and go with Long Beach State. I think Long Beach State, to me, they're just as much of a complete team as UC Irvine. I mean, UC Irvine is fun to watch, but I think Long Beach State can adjust. I think Long Beach State can also play some darn good defense. Like, they block the ball really well. They serve tough. And honestly, I really think that they just adjust well to some of these other teams' game plans. Now, obviously, they just can't. it's not going to be a good recipe for success being down 0-2 and then expecting a reverse sweep. It doesn't work that way, no. They're just going to have to come 
and play really smart volleyball. Just because at this point of the season, UC Irvine is fighting for its NCAA tournament lives. And they know they are they only have one win against the top ten currently. Well, obviously, well, no, I shouldn't say against the top ten, but against, uh, they obviously beat Pepperdine, but it's like, they have three wins. They beat Pepperdine, and then they get beat BYU, but it's like, other than that, they have not really fared a whole lot well against the top ten. They lost twice to Hawaii, they lost twice to UCLA, they lost to Penn State, they lost to Long Beach State, they lost twice to Grand Canyon, they split against BYU... They did beat Pepperdine, which was kind of impressive, I guess. They also beat Stanford on the road, which I guess is good, maybe. But it's like, that's kind of where the buck stops with the Anteaters. I mean, the Anteaters really need to prove themselves, and they need a top five win to consider themselves as an at-large team for the NCAA tournament. So, we'll see what happens with the Anteaters and Long Beach State, but I got Long Beach State going to the Big West Conference Tournament Finals, and then the team that I have winning the conference, the Big West Conference Tournament is Hawaii. I hate having to pick against Long Beach State, but it's like, Hawaii is just too good, and they have been playing so cerebral. Now, again, I will eat my crow if Long Beach State pulls off the upset, but here's the thing about Hawaii. They have played so, they have played really great. I can't pick against them, they have such a good senior class, and they've just been all over it. They have great players like Spiros Chakas, Jakob Tele, Dimitrius Michilas, Brett Sheward, Guillermo Voss. The list goes on and on for this team. And honestly, I can't pick against Hawaii just because they also have a mastermind coaching staff. I mean, I could see the same for Long Beach State. And Sotiris Shapanis has been such a great addition for Long Beach State ever since the departure of Alex Nikolov. And obviously the other usual suspects for Long Beach State, such as Spencer Olivier, Clark Godbold, Simon Torwe, Shane Holdaway, the list goes on and on. They've been great for Long Beach State. And you also have to give credit to Nathan Harlan as well, who's been a great little security blanket just in case Long Beach State needs that serving run. But I just think Hawaii is going to come out just a little... They're, they're going to come out much better than what most people have given them credit for. And for those that are going to say, well, Hawaii's not going to do good in California, no. I think Hawaii is going to do just as good in California as they do in Stan Sheriff Center. Because, honestly, their only two losses are in Stan Sheriff Center. Or Simplify Arena, as you kids like to call it, but I think we could all dismiss the whole Hawaii does not do good outside of Stan Sheriff Center theory, because Hawaii is, does do good in other states, such as California and whatnot, so I think for Hawaii, they will be just as good. Now, going on to the bid stealers, here's the thing for Princeton. If Princeton wins the EIVA tournament, I think they could steal a bid as they'll, w- they'll obviously win the EIVA tournament, but I think Penn State gets into the NCAA tournament just because they've been top five throughout the entire season. I'd be very shocked to see Penn State out of the NCAA tournament, even as an at-large. Now, if UC Irvine wins the Big West Conference tournament, or if they make it to the finals of the Big West Conference tournament, I think Irvine gets into the tournament... As an at-large. I think Irvine, Hawaii, and Long Beach get in, depending on what happens. And I'm sure Long Beach will get in as an at-large, even if they lose in the semifinals or the finals. So that could be another bid stealer right there. I mean, UC Irvine has played a tough schedule, and I'm sure the committee will reward them for a tough schedule. And, that I mean, that's what... David Niffen told me a while back ago. He said that if he wants to get if he wants to have like twenty win seasons, he'll schedule knockoff opponents. But if he wants to put himself in a position to the point where his team wants to make the NCAA tournament, then he's going to schedule tough opponents to the point where his team will possibly, hence the word possibly, 
getting that large. So UC Irvine could be a possible bid stealer right there for the Big West, let alone for the NCAA. Stanford could all, Stanford or Grand Canyon could be a bid stealer, but Grand Canyon is on UCLA's side of the bracket, and Stanford just has had no answers for UCLA. And same with BYU. And honestly, I don't know if Stanford is going to get into the NCAA tournament as an at-large. I can see BYU getting in as an at-large, especially if they make the MPSF tournament finals, but it's like, I don't know where the buck stops after that. I just think that Stanford, if they were to win the MPSF, they would be a bid stealer, just because UCLA would have to be an at-large, and that, just because they've been top five most of the season, and to have them out of the tournament would be a heinous crime, in my opinion. So... We'll see what happens. And I'm not sure if there's going to be any bid stealers from the MIVA if, for some odd reason, the, whatchamacallit, uh, what's their face? If McKendry or Lewis managed to pull off an upset in in either or in either semifinal going into the final and whatnot. And for the EIVA, the only way Penn State doesn't make the NCAA tournament is if they lose in the semifinals. But honestly, I could still see Penn State making the NCAA tournament, even if they lose in the EIVA semifinals. But honestly, Penn State is such is has been really good most of the season. They even have a win over number one Hawaii. They're the only team that has not lost to Hawaii. Well, I shouldn't say that, but... They're the only team that has beaten Hawaii, that has successfully beaten Hawaii and not lost to them this season. Not lost to Hawaii this season. That made no sense, but either way, ahem, I, I just think Penn State should be a good at-large, even though they lost to Ohio State the week after they beat Hawaii, so there's that. All right, so that's pretty much that for my bid stealers and my predictions for all the conference tournaments. Let me know your predictions for the conference tournaments. And I hope I didn't miss any conference tournaments. I think I got them all. The Conference of Carolinas, the NEC, the MIVA, the EIVA, the MPSF, and the Big West. I know there's the individual... uh, the individual or independent conference tournament, but I don't really want to count that. I don't want to count that as well, unless, of course, y'all want me to do like a separate breakdown video of that, but I digress on that. But anyway, that's going to do it for the NCAA men's volleyball side of things. When we come back, we'll take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, we'll talk some NCAA beach volleyball, some AVP, and we'll go over some of the NBA matches that I missed last week. So don't go anywhere. You are listening to Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. What is going on, everybody? My name is Harrison Glazer, and we're coming at you from the show that never sleeps podcast. I cover the Jets, the Islanders, the Nets, and the Yankees. This is Pierre Moss, and I cover the Mets, Knicks, Rangers and the Giants. Our show is live every Wednesday through Spreaker and a bunch of other ways to get our content. Again, we're the show that never sleeps podcast. We talk about all those New York sports. It's a lot of fun. We get into all of it. Please tune in again. That's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And we look forward to having you guys right here on Night Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hello, ladies and sinners. Hello, sports fans around the world. Hello, IE Sports family. This is Cal Henderson, the host of IE Vegas, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. If you folks are interested in sports in the Vegas area, if you're wanting to have a blast for one hour, 
every Tuesday night from 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. This is a show built for the Vegas sports fans where we feature the Las Vegas Raiders, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Aces, and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada Rebels. Hopefully, fingers crossed, MLB team coming soon. Either way, if you folks are looking to have a blast for one hour each and every week, tune in Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you folks are interested in Vegas sports news, go to our Twitter, at SinCities underscore I-E-S-R, and you can speak with me, the host, Kale Henderson, at Kale underscore Henderson on Twitter. At any time, be happy to reply always want to reach out to our fans again the sin city sports show presented by ie sports radio your direct feed for all that is sports Sports fans, do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh, yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. with segment number two of Set Point here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Definitely check out all of our amazing shows, such as The Show That Never Sleeps with Pierre Moss, Sin City Sports with Cale Henderson, and Let's Wine About DMV Sports with Mike Pat, who just popped in the chat room earlier. He said, have a great show, sir. Love me some Set Point. Appreciate you, Mike. Marcus looks great. Just popped in the chat room. He says, salute. Thank you, Marcus. Let's jump on into segment number two of Set Point. So let's talk about some NCAA beach volleyball. And last weekend, we had the Center of Effort Challenge, which took place in San Luis Obispo, or Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And UCLA impressed everyone as they wound up winning the whole thing. They even beat number one and previously undefeated TCU, which was very surprising. But then again, UCLA was the only team... That hadn't re- well, the only top ranked team, or the only ranked team that hadn't really faced TCU. So TCU was not really expecting much from the Bruins, as UCLA managed to hand TCU its first loss of the season, and now there are no more undefeated NCAA beach volleyball teams. So unfortunately for TCU, they took one on the chin and. It kind of came down. It came down to the last pair. It came down to the threes pair, but UCLA was able to come out on top, and they were able to basically win the pair three. They won the duel three to two, and they improved their record and they improved their chances of winning the center of effort challenge. Eventually, UCLA and USC faced one another in the center of effort challenge final, and UCLA came out on top. Of that matchup, as they narrowly won that one, three to two, it came down to the final pair, and I want to say it was also the threes pair. If not, it was like the two or fours pair. Either way, it came down to the final pair between UCLA and USC, and UCLA was able to come out on top, which was downright impressive. 
And it actually came down to the fives pair, which was Jaden Whitmarsh and Devin Newberry. And that's not surprising, just because Whitmarsh and Newberry are both catalysts and veterans when it comes to this team. So for UCLA to win that one in the nail-binding fashion and on the fives, it's no surprise. So... Where you see a like, good win for them, they will be. They were currently number three in the most recent AVCA coaches poll from last week, as USC was number two, TCU was number one, Florida State finished fourth as they lost to TCU in the third place match. TCU, despite losing to UCLA, they finished strong, and there are some other teams that partook in this, like LMU. LSU, and then I think I want to say GCU also partook in this. Stanford, to my surprise, got upset by Arizona, which I don't think anybody predicted. Or actually, it wasn't Arizona that beat them. It was it was it was another team that I don't think anybody I don't think anybody predicted this team to beating a top ten team, and it was. Houston Christian University, yes, HCU, Houston Christian University upset number 10 Stanford on Saturday, which was at, which was actually in the Tiger Beach Challenge, so that was separate from the Center of Effort Challenge, so this was another challenge that Stanford was partaking in, so I was very surprised to see this upset, it's like, wait, what? So, good for HCU for beating Stanford. Nobody, I don't, I don't think anybody predicted that. But Stanford, the day before, beat LSU in that same little tournament 3-2. to two. So the fact that Stanford was able to win that little thing, win that little matchup, is quite amazing as well. So I'm just going to say this. UCLA is probably going to be number one. TCU, I think, is two. USC will be three. I will give USC the benefit of the doubt. They did beat Florida State as well, and they also beat LMU in day one of the Center of Effort Challenge, but unfortunately, they kind of let one slip away against UCLA, but what can you do? I mean, facing Devin Newberry and Jaden Whitmarsh and your fives pair isn't as up to snuff as as, uh, their fives pair, but it is what it is. Like, USC will be fine. They did pick up their 300th program victory over the weekend, which I thought was very impressive, if you ask me. So, I think for USC, this is kind of a good wake-up call, because it's better that they lost now than they lose in the NCAA tournament and whatnot. I mean, has anyone even really heard of Bailey Showalter and Ashlyn Racenick Pope? No offense, but it's like I've never even heard of those two prior to this season. So the fact that David, not David, Devin Newberry and Jaden Whitmarsh beat Sh- Bailey Shulwater and Ashlyn Racenick Pope in the final matchup of the duel, it's kind of not surprising that UCLA came out on top of that. So it is what it is for USC, but they just got to get up off the mat and they have to basically just. They just have to basically just move on from it. There's no use crying over spilt milk when it comes to them, just because they're too good of a program to take that loss lying down. So we'll see what happens for USC going forward. I know that this week is their senior week or senior day, as they've got a lot of... I wouldn't say they've got a lot of catching up to do, but they've got some... They've got some a few big matches here and there, such as the twentieth or Thursday. They've they're at UCLA, and then they've also got LMU. So, goodness, that's a that's a big matchup right there. But tomorrow, as of this recording, they play Cal State Bakersfield on their senior day, which I'm sure USC is going to bounce back in a nice way. And then next week they've got the Pac-12 championship, and then they've eventually got the NCAA tournament, which if USC does not make the NCAA tournament, we riot. Just because they are the reigning champions, and they have been top five throughout the entire season. The problem is they just haven't been able to be number one just because UCLA has been a thing, and then TCU has been occupying number one throughout the entire season. Until now, of course, as 
TCU lost their first match of the season, and I'm fairly certain they're going to fall out of number one. And like I said on Twitter on Friday, UCLA's coming for that number one spot, and I think for UCLA, they're making that case of getting that number one spot. So that is that for some NCAA beach volleyball. My big thing for the NCAA beach volleyball teams is this. Even if your team did not do well this weekend, whether it was in center of effort challenge or whether it was in something else, you still got your conference tournament, and then you just got to do well in that. Otherwise, basically, it's game over for your season. Because I don't know if a whole lot of these conferences are going to be or, or I don't know if the committee will be able to take a whole lot of these uh, at-large teams, but we'll see what happens going forward. All right, but that's that for the NCAA beach volleyball side of things. Staying with N- with the beach volleyball side of things, we have the AVP, which happened this past weekend. Well, actually, before I get on into the AVP, I actually do want to give a big shout-out to the NAI men's volleyball champion, Vanguard, on winning the NAIA championship as they beat Jamestown in pool. They beat Jamestown and Grandview, last last year's champion, in pool play. Then they beat the Masters College in the semifinals in five sets. And then they beat Benedictine of Arizona in reverse sweep fashion, 20-25, 23-25, 25-22, 25-22, and 15-11. And they won off of a walk-off service ace on championship point. There's, I know it's always great to win off of a walk-off block, but winning off of a walk-off service ace on championship point is just a amazing feeling. And this ball wasn't even touched by the opposing team. It was just straight up inbounds, Line judge ruled it in. Clearly inbounds. No challenges needed. Pandemonium on the court. Vanguard University is the champion. I do want to give a shout out to a good buddy of mine who is also a part of the coaching staff, Eric Valley, as this is actually his second championship in in terms of like a in terms of like yearly a yearly sort of thing. Because last year, he was actually the head coach of Newport Harbor High School, and his team was eventually crowned national champions by Max Preps. Now he's on the coaching staff, coaching staff of Vanguard University, and now he is a NAIA champion with the likes of Brian Rofer, who, in his first season as head coach, managed to bring home a national championship or an NAIA championship to... Lo- Vanguard, which I think is quite incredible. But you also have to give credit to the likes of former Vanguard University men's volleyball coach and uh, current UC San Diego men's volleyball coach Brad Rostrader because he was the one that started Vanguard University and eventually Vanguard took off. And now they're an NAI champion. So, and they only won 20 games and they didn't even win their conference tournament. And believe it or not, the Masters College, the team that beat Vanguard in the NA or not the NAI, the GSAC tournament, they actually was the victim of losing to Vanguard in the NAI semifinals. So for Vanguard, it's just a really good storybook ending, just because Vanguard hasn't really been well known for winning NAI championships. I know they have one in men's basketball, and they've come close in women's volleyball a few times back in the olden days. I think, I'm not sure about Vanguard's history. I'd have to brush up on that, but I do know that there will be a new championship banner. And one more thing to add about Vanguard is that they didn't even have a home court advantage. They had to play some of their home games just because their gymnasium is under renovation and it's going to be built as a bigger it's going to be built bigger. It's not going to be like a high school gymnasium. It's going to be like a big gymnasium like a – I don't know if it's going to be like as big as the pyramid or whatnot, but it's going to be a bigger gymnasium than it was previously. But Vanguard men's volleyball didn't even did not have a true home court advantage. They had to play their games either at Calvary Chapel High School or Orange Coast College – 
So the fact that Vanguard didn't have a true home court advantage and they managed to win an NAI championship is extremely special. And who knows what's going to happen with Vanguard going forward. I'm sure the sky's the limit for the Lions. And again, they didn't even win their conference tournament. So it speaks to high volumes of how hard the Lions have worked. And again, lots of big shouts to Brian Rofer and the entire coaching staff especially my two buddies, Eric Valley and Paca Dutro. So, and congratulations to the players as well. I knew some of the players. I've covered some of the players at Vanguard back in their heyday at junior college or in high school. So, here's hoping for Vanguard can bring home another... Here's hoping Vanguard can bring home more NAI championships because I'm sure they've got more left in the tank for next season. Not bad for an Orange County for, for school from Orange County. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying that just to be disrespectful. I'm just saying that just because, you know, I digress. Anyway, so that's that for the NAI sort of things. Now let's jump on into the AVP. So AVP time as the AVP took us to New Orleans. And oh my goodness... The, the New Orleans. I'm just gonna say this to Mother Nature. Why do you got? Why did you have to have a storm in this past weekend? Why did you have to make make the AVP suffer for having a storm? Like, why couldn't you have? You chose this week to have a storm in New Orleans of all weeks where there was an AVP tournament. Thanks a lot, Mother Nature. Just it didn't get canceled or anything, but there were delays, and, e- and unfortunately, the AVP blow-up ball kind of blew away, and it eventually landed in a tree. <laughs> it was kind of funny, and uh, there's even a little bit of a video of the AVP the AVP ball uh, blowing away. Uh, someone should. I, I think someone made the comment Wilson. <laughs> which was pretty funny. I don't know if that's the official ball of the AVP, but it's like... It, it, that's pretty funny. Someone saying, Wilson! <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It, it, it just was a funny comment on Twitter. Uh, people in their Twitter jokes. Anyway. Okay, to the AVP before uh, I lose my composure... <laughs> All right, on the women's side of things, it was quite fun seeing the LS, former LSU players, especially when it came to, like, Tony Rodriguez, no relation to me, by the way, and Savvy Simo, who didn't go to LSU. She went to UCLA. And mostly Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss. So, for the four semifinalists... Uh, Kelly Cheng and Sarah Hughes were the, one of the finalists. They were the number one overall seed, while Julia Scholes and Betsy Flint made the other semifinal, or the same semifinal, while Melissa Humana Paredes and Brandy Wilkerson also made the semifinals of the New Orleans Open, while the last semifinals was Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss, as they actually had to win their way through the contenders bracket, but they were able to eke their way past Savvy Simo and Tony Rodriguez, which was quite something. They actually had to go to a third set, and I was kind of seeing the scores while I was at work, and I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good for uh, Team Tiger, a.k.a. Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss. But they were able to pull out the win and advance to the semifinals. Unfortunately for Cloth and Nuss, they kind of fell in the finals as, or uh, they fell in the semifinals as they lost to the Canadian duo Hum- Melissa Humana Paredes and Brandy Wilkerson, 16 21, 21 15, and 15 13. They're actually down, I, what was it, like 14 11? Or actually, they were down 13 10, and they almost came back to win that third set, but unfortunately, it just was not meant to be, so. Sadly for Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss, they were unable to defend their home sand. But hey, at least they got to play in front of their crowd. Their, I wouldn't say their home crowd, but their, uh, the crowd in Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana. As for the other semifinal, Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes won their semifinal, but they had to work for this semifinal. They 
they got hammered in that first set, 21 to 8 against Julia Scholes and Betsy Flint. Second set, they squeaked out that win, 21 to 19. And then set three, they needed extra points to win, but they wound up winning set three, 16 to 14. They advanced to the finals to take on the two seed, Humana Paredes and Brandy Wilkerson. And eventually, Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes laid down the wood against Melissa Humana Paredes and Brandy Wilkerson as they swept them 21 9 and 21 18. I kind of was not expecting that. I thought the Canadian duo, Melissa and Brandy, would actually force a third set. But unfortunately, Sarah Hughes and Kelly Chang proved why they were the number one seed, and they showed that they are not to be messed around with. So good job to Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes. They only lost two sets all tournament, and one of which was actually to Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss, which was in the winner's bracket, or the upper side of the bracket. But for but for Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes, they win their first AVP tournament of the season, and they managed to do they managed to do so without going through the contenders bracket. So jumping over to the men's side, where I'm going to spoil it, the men's final did go three. But as for the final four, that consisted of top seed Triborn and Kame Shulk, as well as Timothy Brewster and. Kyle Friend. Yes. Timothy Brewster and Kyle Friend. The other semifinal consisted of three seed Troy Field and Billy Allen and six seed Cody Caldwell and Chase Frischman. Yes, the same Cody Caldwell from the Orange County Stunners. So the first semifinal was between Allen and Field taking on Col- Caldwell and Frischman. Long story short, the la- the. Allen and Field swept Caldwell and Frischman 21-18, 21-14, and advanced to the final. In the other semifinal, it was quite fascinating as Shulk and Bourne lost the first set 21-17 to Brewster and Friend, but then they won the second set 21-19, and then the third set came Shulk and Triborn won that set 15-12, advancing to the final. And then, like I said, the match went three. The match went three sets. Billy Allen and Troy Field took that first set in dramatic fashion, twenty-seven twenty-five. It felt like I was watching an indoor match, but it wasn't an indoor match, just because the target score in beach volleyball is twenty-one points. But when I saw twenty-seven twenty-five, it's like, oh my goodness, that that was quite the wild first set. But then in set two. Shulk and Bourne kind of reestablished themselves. They took that second set 21-12. Then set three, Bourne and Shulk just were too much for Billy Allen and Troy Field as they took that third set 15-10, winning the New Orleans Open, which the top seeds basically reigned supreme in the AVP. So it wasn't ultimately surprising, but it's like it would have been great to see some sort of chaos. But it is what it is. So the next AVP tournament will be on May 19th through the 21st when the AVP will be coming to beautiful California for the Huntington Beach Open. Now, I am really hoping I can make that tournament. It's just that it might be tough just because life gets in the way for me. And I don't want to miss that tournament just because... Well, it's going to be the only time I get to see the AVP in Huntington Beach, let alone in California, unless I want to go all the way down to Manhattan Beach. But that's kind of a little far out my area. But And then there's also the Laguna Beach Open, but that's going to be after the championships. But I digress. I will do all I can to make the AVP tournament in Huntington Beach. I promise you all, even if it means... I have to basically, like, I have to, like, negotiate and interface with my bosses and whatnot. But we'll see. All right, so that is that for the AVP. So before I send you all on your way, I actually want to go over some of the matches that I missed, the NVA matches that I missed from last week. So I went over some, but I didn't go over all of them. And that's kind of my bad. So, sorry. But anyway, in the first matchup on day one of the NVA, we had the 
Southern Expo, the Florida Southern Exposure, because that's what they're now called, the Florida Southern Exposure defeating the Inland Empire Matadors in four sets, which I wasn't surprised that they won that match just because, well, I, at first I, I wasn't surprised, but honestly, I will say this about uh, about the, uh, whatchamacallit, the Southern Exposure. I think they're a darn good team, and they're going to continue to get better. They just got to get their entire roster because they only had nine players available, and that's not going to really help your case in terms of, you know, winning matches on a consistent and weekly basis. So for Southern Exposure, it was a great way to kick off the season, and most people thought it was going to be a blowout or a sweep, but I had this strange inkling that... The Inland Empire Matadors were going to have some sort of battle. And honestly, the Matadors brought it. So, overall, for whatchamacallit, for Southern Exposure, it's it was quite imp- impressive as uh, they w- the Exposure won the first set 25-17, but then the Matadors won the second set 23-25, or 25-23, then in set number 3, uh, the exposure wound up winning the third set. I want to say it was like 25-18. And then in set number four, the exposure won that fourth set, 25-18, winning the match. And leading them in the win, and leading the exposure in the win was Zach Meyer, who had 12 kills. Sam Jackman had 10 kills. Tyler Hubbard kneeled. Despite only having three kills, he had three service aces and five blocks. Orlando Rojas, a.k.a. Jr., had 16 kills and 4 blocks. Isaac Leva had four, had 8 kills and 5 blocks for the Matadors. So it was a solid win for the Matadors, or for the Southern Exposure. Second match of the, uh, sorry. Second match of the, of the event number one was the San Diego Wild taking on the Utah Stingers. First two sets, the Wild won 25-23. Then in the third set, the Stingers, they had their chances, and, and they eventually did win the third set, 27-25. But then the fourth set, the Wild really went wild all over. <laughs> nope, I'm, I'm so bad with that pun. They went wild all over the Stingers as they won that third, that fourth set, 25-16. The Wild were led by Joel Auerkamp, who had 20 kills. Think about the event number one is that no one is really at full strength. The scary thing about the San Diego Wild is that they are not at full strength, and they have yet to unleash their full, full potential. But once they do, watch out. Owen Carlinzig also had 11 kills for the Wild, as he also had three blocks. Uchenna Ofo- Ofoa had 10 kills for the Wild. For the Stingers, they were led by Jorge Mencia, who had 11 kills. Sam Cobrin, the former UCLA Bruins slash USC Trojan, had nine kills in his NBA debut. Meek. McKeel Hoyt had nine kills as well. Fabian Rohena had eight kills. Storm Fagata Tafuga had seven kills. So it was kind of a balanced effort from the Stingers. Next matchup we had was the Texas Tyrants taking on the Chicago Untouchables. Long story short, the Tyrants swept the Untouchables. The first set was kind of the closest of the sets, but the Tyrants emerged victorious, winning that 25-22. They won the second set 25-16, and won the third 25-20. The Tyrants were led by Ryan Mather, who had 15 kills, making his debut with the Tyrants. Jake Langloy added 11 kills, while the Untouchables were led by Grant Maleski. Contrary to popular belief, it's Maleski, not Molski. He had 7 kills. Joshua Blair had 5 kills. He's a newcomer from the NVA to the NVA. I already talked about Stunners Pythons with Matt Proster last week, but in case you missed it, Stunners won in five sets, 
and they got big games from Damani Lenore, Col- Cody Caldwell. They even got some solid games from Nick West and Matt Hilling. The Pythons were led by Jair Santiago, the former stunner, who had 20 kills, while Orlando Santiago ha- had 10 kills. That is that for day one. Day two, we had the New Jersey Freedom sweeping the Puerto Rico Pythons. Like I said, this was kind of unfair for the Pythons just because they were the last match of day one and they're the first match of day two. So that's like, that's not really fair for them, but I digress. I don't do the schedule around here. Anyway, the Freedom were led by Joe Norman, or I'm sorry, Jared Ray, who had 12 kills. Joe Norman had 11 kills. F- fun fact about uh, the NVA and its stats, they don't really track assists and digs and whatnot. I don't know why. Don't, don't, I don't know why. But for those that are wondering about assists and digs and whatnot, they don't track them for the time being. Sorry. Excuse me a second. Anyway, for the Pythons, they were led by Jair Santiago, who had 10 kills. Ricky Vega had 7 kills. Next match we had was the Philadelphia Founders taking on the Utah Stingers. The Founders kicked off their NVA season as they made their NVA debut. Unfortunately, they were shown the door fairly quickly as they lost to the Stingers in three sets. The first set was kind of what took the wind out of their sails. They lost that first set 31-29, which for the time being as of this recording is the most of any set. And then they lost and then uh, the Stingers won the next two 25-12 and then 25-18. The Stingers were led by Sam Cobrin who had 9 kills. The Founders were led by Michael Lewis who had 7 kills. Nate Reynolds had four blocks to go along with his five kills. So for the founders, it was just a tough loss for them. Jumping over to the next match, we had the Texas Tyrants taking on the Los Angeles Blaze. Had to do it like uh, Mr. Garvey from uh, Substitute Teacher in that uh, Paramount Plus commercial. As we welcome Cale Henderson into the chat room, it's actually good that he's here because I'm actually about to go over the Las Vegas Ramblers. But first, Texas Tyrants versus Los Angeles Blaze. Tyrants took the first two sets, 25-22, 25-19, but then the Blaze won the, the third set, 25-21, then they, but then the Tyrants reestablished themselves. They won the fourth set, 25-18. The Blaze didn't have a head coach, but unlike the Cleveland Browns, the Texas Tyrants actually knew what they were doing. And they were led by Jake Langloy, who had 19 kills, Ryan Mather had 16 kills, Austin Matawatia had 10 kills. He was pretty impressive in his NVA debut. And Joseph Grosch added 8 kills. The Los Angeles Blaze, they were led by 14 kills. While Andrew Dubé had seven ki- or 9 kills. Manuel Andrade had 7 kills. Unfortunately for the Los Angeles Blaze, they did not have a middle blocker. Which was quite the bummer. Like, they had no middle blockers and they had to have their opposites play middle blockers. So, it's tough to win a match when you don't have your full team. Alright, now for Kale's team. The Las Vegas Ramblers taking on the Florida Southern Exposure. So, in the first set, the Ramblers looked like the Ramblers. They won the first set 25-21. Second set, the Exposure looked like the Exposure that I kind of felt was going to be decent this year as they won that second set 25-19. The third set, it took the Ramblers a little bit of an effort to close out this third set. They actually were up 24-22. The Southern Exposure tied it up at 24 apiece, but then the Exposure shot themselves in the foot with a couple of errors, and eventually the Ramblers took that third set 26-24. Then in the fourth set, the Ramblers, being the really good team that they are, closed out the match, despite it having to go to Deuce yet again, as they wound up winning the fourth set 28-26. The Ramblers were led by Felix Chapman, who had 15 kills. Jalen Penrose had 13 kills. Eric Beatty had six, had 8 kills. Kevin Vaz had 5 blocks. 
Tim Lurich had four blocks, and Penrose had four blocks as well. So, Southern Exposure, they were led by Logan Riding, who had 16 kills. Zach Meyer had 11 kills. Tyler Hubbard Neal had 10 kills to go along with four blocks and two service aces. Aaron King had four kills to go along with five blocks. But it wasn't enough as the Ramblers, in their NVA debut from last year, or for this year, wound up winning, which was big time right there. Jumping over to day number three, we had the San Diego Wild finishing their weekend 2 and 0 as they swept the Philadelphia Founders 28 26, 25 22, and 25 20. Now, just like the first set against the Stingers, the Founders had set point, but unfortunately could not close the deal against the Wild, as the Wild winning that set eventually was smooth sailing for them. And Nick England told me, who was also the head coach, he told me that other than the 13 missed serves, they did not ex- they did not get any surprises from the founders, and they they knew they had to be disciplined. And he was very proud of the team that he rolled out this weekend or this past weekend, as the Wild were led by Joel Auerkamp, who had 18 kills. Kendall Ratter had eight kills. Uchenna Ofoa had seven kills. Ryder also chipped in four service aces. For the Founders, they were led by Ryan Schickling, who had seven kills. Nate Reynolds and Sean Dillon each had five kills. Nate Reynolds had six blocks. So, unfortunately for the Founders, it was a rough weekend. They went 0-2, but they still have time to turn it around, especially when they don't have their head... I don't think they have their... Oh, no, they do have their head coach. I'm thinking of the Untouchables. Which is actually a perfect segue to go into the Los Angeles Blaze Chicago Untouchables matchup. So the Blaze won the first two matchup, the first two sets, 25-23, 25-22. Then the Untouchables won the second or the third set, 25-22. And then they wound up eking out that fourth set, 26-24. And then just like the previous meeting from last year, the Untouchables won that fifth set but they didn't need, like, extra points. They wound up winning it 15-12, as the Chicago Untouchables, even without a head coach and their GM, who was at day one, but unfortunately was not at day two, um, they wound up winning, which was quite incredible. As the Untouchables were led by Joshua Blair, who had 17 kills, Hank Payne had 16 kills, Grant Mailski, 15 kills, and Daniel Venegas, at 11 kills. Blair also chipped in 6 blocks, while Zakir Pasha, 5 blocks, Mailski and Payne each had 4 blocks. For the Blaze, Andrew Dubé had 17 kills, while Charles Belvin had 16 kills, Dexter Campbell had 14 kills. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you don't have a middle blocker, but it's only event one. Like, eventually, these teams are going to find their way of getting back to full strength. Excuse me a second. Pardon me. (laughs) Sorry. Then we've got the Orange County Centers taking on the New Jersey Freedom. Like I said, I discussed this matchup with Matt Prosser last week, so I don't really need to go into full detail, but the Freedom won in four sets, and they won it off a walk-off service ace. Freedom were led by Joe Norman, who had 19 kills. Tim Furriter had 11 kills. Jared Ray had 8 kills. Ian Cap, before getting injured, had 7 kills. That was what really hurt them in the match. Ian Cap got hurt in set 3. He hurt his left foot, and he did come back in as a serving specialist, but he is hoping to not miss event number two, but he should be fine. As for the Stunners, they were led by Matt Hilling, who had 15 kills, Damani Lenoir, 13 kills. Unfortunately for the Stunners, they just didn't look like them, like the Friday selves when they played the Pythons, but that's just because New Jersey Freedom is good. But the goal for the Stunners is not to be good as of right now. It's to be good come July 30th, or the last week of July. Alright, 
And one more, t- one more quick second, real quick. All right, and then the last matchup of the event one was Las Vegas Ramblers taking on the Inland Empire Matadors, and this was the biggest, the big win, the uh, big upset of the weekend, the surprise match of the weekend as the Matadors took down the Ramblers. I'm sorry, Kale. 16-25, 25-19, 17-25, 25-16, and 15-13. Now, there were some questionable calls in that fifth set. And, unfortunately, there were some calls that the Ramblers just could not challenge. Just because there were judgment calls. But, you have to give credit to the Matadors. Like, this is probably their biggest win in a while. Just because they haven't really had a big-time win like this in quite some time. So... For the matters to win like this is quite amazing. So the Matadors were led by Cesar Medina, who had 17 kills. He also had five service aces. Isaac Leva, Orlando Rojas, and Jimmy Montes each had nine kills. For the Ramblers, they were led by Felix Chapman, who had a whopping 26 kills. He had over half of the Ramblers' kills altogether. The next kill leader wasn't even remotely close to him, as Eric Beatty and Jalen Penrose each had six kills. I kind of didn't understand why Miguel Monterola took out Penrose in the second set. Now, I understand maybe he was preserving him and trying to get other players involved, but you kind of don't want to do that unless you're up by a significant chunk. You, you really want to go for the throat early on. Lurich, Tim Lurich had five blocks, and Felix Chapman had four blocks as well. But unfortunately for the Rambler, Ramblers, they suffered their first loss of the season. Hopefully, for their sake, it's not multiple losses, but they're, one of their players, Spencer Williams, I want to say, the libero for the Ramblers at that weekend, he said the goal is not to be good in... April, the goal is to be good by the time July 30th rolls around. They want to be in that championship game. So we'll see what happens with the Ramblers come next week. Miguel Montserola said he's got a couple surprises for the Ramblers next or for the Ramblers going forward before the deadline. The free agent deadline is what I presume he means, but That's pretty much that for the NVA in terms of the recap. And ladies and gentlemen, that is going to do it for this week's episode of Set Point. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time for me to drop the beat because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to Set Point. I really do appreciate everybody tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I really appreciate you. Shout out to the chat room, Gail Henderson, Larry B, Mike Pat, and Marcus Lowstraight. Saying salute to the hardest working man here at Icebox Radio. Salute to you, Marcus. Apologies for missing last week, or yesterday, because I was at work. But salute to you and your show, and salute to Kale Henderson as well. I will be back next week for Set Point, and I will be at the Brent Event Center at UC Irvine for those that want to see and say hi to me and maybe get some pictures with me. I'll also be back on Friday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. But until then, have yourself a great rest of the week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will catch you later. Peace!